When it comes to games that had a long development cycle, most people think of games that didn't turn out so well, but there are a few games like this that actually turned out to be pretty good. One of those games is 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. Originally released for the PS4 in 2019 in Japan and 2020 everywhere else, this game pretty much flew under everyone's radar but developed somewhat of a cult following, and now this game is getting a second chance with its port to the Nintendo Switch. I originally wanted to cover it when it came out for the PS4, but I just had too many other things going on at the time. But now, that's different. It is time to review 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim for the Nintendo Switch. But first, I'd like to give a big shout out to this video's sponsor, Opera GX. Opera GX is a browser available for both Windows and Mac that is made for gamers and caters to all your gaming related needs. It has a built-in feature that limits CPU usage, RAM, and network bandwidth so that you can leave it open without it affecting your performance while gaming and listening to music. It also has a built-in sidebar that allows you to easily communicate with your friends on Discord, Messenger, WhatsApp, and Telegram. You can also use the sidebar to easily log into music streaming services like Spotify, Apple Music, and YouTube Music, and it'll automatically pause when you start streaming other audio or video in other tabs. And last but not least, you can also get Opera GX on your smartphone, and it can connect to Opera GX on your desktop, allowing you to share messages and files between the two with ease. Once again, this browser has been tweaked to minimize performance in the background while gaming on your phone, and its fast action button allows easy one-handed navigation with haptic feedback. Whether you're watching this on your computer or your phone, I highly encourage you guys to check Opera GX out using the link down below in the description. It's free to download, and I cannot recommend it enough. I want to give a big thank you to Opera GX for sponsoring this review, and now that that's out of the way, let's get back to the video. So what exactly is 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim all about? Well, it's a mech game that follows the story of, well, 13 Sentinels who are tasked to protect Japan from invaders known as the Daimos. Because it's a mech game, that obviously means the pilots of said mechs can't be trained military professionals, they instead have to be high school students that wear extremely tight clothing, or in this case no clothing at all, while they pilot them. The game is set in a fictionalized 1985 during Japan's Showa period, but the plot involves time travel and it occasionally jumps to 1945, 2025, 2065, and 2105, and many of the pilots you command are from these periods. That's about as much as I could say without getting into spoilers, but I really like the cast. My favorite characters would have to be Kisaragi, Minami, Fuyusaka, and Kurabe. And I also like the way the characters from different time periods all interact with one another. And learning about their relationships with each other is pretty cool. And overall, it's definitely a very interesting premise and story. At first, the story may seem hard to follow with all the different time periods and all the different characters, but the more you play, the more you'll understand it. Rather than be told in a linear style with battles in between, it's divided into three modes. Remembrances, Destruction, and Analysis. Remembrances is basically your story mode, where you play through the characters' individual stories and, well, remember the events that led up to the Destruction mode. This mode has you walking around the game's world in this pseudo-2D side-scrolling style, and you walk around, talk to NPCs, and collect information that you present to these NPCs to progress. Whenever you learn something new that's relevant to the story, it'll get added to what's called the Thought Cloud, which you pull up with the X button, and you can use it to either further consider information or present information to the other characters. That's about all there is to this mode regarding gameplay, but the story more than makes up for this. What I like about this mode is that all the game's different characters have their own stories. Normally I'd complain that this feels like more than necessary, especially in this case because there's no combat anywhere in these sections, but for one thing, all these stories are very well written and well told, but they're all told differently. It's not just a mode where you play through the same story from each of the characters' different perspectives. These stories pretty much all fall into their own literary genres, and they all take heavy inspiration from other famous sci-fi movies and anime. For example, there's Ninji Ogata, a biker who is repeatedly sent back on a mission to get some kind of key before Tokyo gets attacked and the train he's on derails. So, basically, source code. There's A. Sakigahara, who is struggling with amnesia after being sent back from the future to prevent certain events from happening, so Terminator or Twelve Monkeys. And then there's Megumi Yakushiji, who is going around carrying out quote-unquote assassination missions for a talking cat. So basically, a really f 
fucked up magical girl anime. These stories range from engaging and charming to extremely messed up, and these are just a few of my favorites. You would think that with so many different characters and so many different writing styles that it would just be an absolute mess of a story with no direction, but that's not the case at all. All the plots and characters tie into one another in a way that makes sense. I could gush about these stories for an entire video, but this is really the kind of thing you need to experience for yourself. My only complaint regarding the stories is that sometimes the game isn't exactly clear on what you need to do to move on, and the guides online really aren't all that clear about it either. Now, Destruction Mode is where the real meat of the game is. The gameplay is best described as a blend of turn-based and RTS gameplay, similar in style to the Grow Lancer series if you ever played any of those. You're able to take up to six of the game's 13 characters into battle with you at a time, and as you'd expect, these characters all have their own unique moves and stat distributions, like Ninji and Takatoshi, who specialize in physical attacks, Iori and Renya, who specialize in support, and Keitaro and Tomi, who specialize in ranged attacks. This also applies to the enemies, and it's up to you to figure out the best parties to go with, and the best strategies to carry out each mission, although the game is pretty lenient in this regard, and most competent strategies will work. I generally recommend bringing at least one character of each of these specialties into each mission, and using physical attackers to take out bosses, while using ranged attackers to pick off smaller enemies. Like with any other tactical RPG, you get a menu to select your moves, and then the game carries them out in real time. Some of these moves, such as multi-lock missiles and demolisher blade, take place immediately, while others, such as homing missile and missile rain, activate and take place over the span of a few seconds. There are also moves like sentry gun and interceptors that deploy allies that act for you. After you use a move, you have to wait a certain amount of time before the character that used it can go again and in order to use most moves, you'll need EP. Thankfully, your EP goes back up over time, and you can make it go back up even faster by defending, though. In addition to this, you also have a meta gauge, which also goes up as you play. And once it gets full, you can use a variety of powerful special moves, although the only one I ever really found significant use for was the Phase Plasma EMP. It also wouldn't be a mech game without customization. As you play the game, you'll earn meta chips, which you can use to upgrade your moves, buy new moves, upgrade your stats, and upgrade your meta system so that you can unlock even more skills. Now, the goal of the game is pretty much what you'd expect from an RTS game. Wipe out all the enemies without letting your party die or the enemies destroy the terminal. Thankfully, there's no permadeath system, but if any character dies, it's game over. However, if a character is about to die, the game does give you a chance to save them, which I'll get to in a minute. It's also possible to win battles by just surviving usually two minutes of real-time combat, but I never actually won any battles this way. In pretty much every battle, I won just by eliminating the enemies. So, I just spent a good amount of time explaining how combat works, but the question is, is it fun? And my answer is yes. There's definitely a lot of strategy involved with this game, but not only is it fun, it's also just oddly satisfying. I don't know what it is, but I just love that feeling you get when you launch missiles into a large group of small enemies and watch them all pop like bubbles. But not only this, the gameplay is done in a way that forces you to improvise and adapt to the conditions it throws at you. For one thing, you can't just invest all your experience and meta chips into a select few allies and bulldoze your way through the game, because if characters participate in too many battles, they'll go through a brain overload and won't be able to fight for the next battle. Your party also isn't fully healed between battles. You can restore your party back to full health, but you're actually rewarded by playing through the game without doing this. For every consecutive battle you win without healing, your score multiplier will increase, so I definitely recommend holding out as long as you can. My only real complaint regarding the combat is the balancing. This game is extremely easy. Not only are the enemies weak and easy to take down, but in the rare chances that one of your pilots does get low on health, the game will warn you, and in most cases, you'll have more than enough time to get out of the way, repair your sentinel, and jump back into combat with full health only a few seconds later. I played on intense difficulty, and I only ever lost once. That is, until I got to the third act where there is a massive difficulty spike. It took me dozens of tries to beat the first mission, and the second, I actually had to go out of my way to grind for meta chips just to beat it. Maybe this is just me, because I asked my friends if they were having any issues with it, and they all told me no, so maybe I was just spending my meta chips wrong? 
but it still seems weird that I had almost no issues up until this part of the game. If your experience was any different, feel free to let me know in the comments section. And then there's the analysis section where you can recall parts of the story and learn about the game's lore. As you play, you'll get mystery points, which you can use to unlock mystery files that tell you about the game's lore, but like I said, there's not much to it beyond that. Sometimes the character's stories will require you to unlock mystery files before you can progress, but that's about it. But now let's move on to the presentation. You've probably already noticed just from the footage on screen, but this is an absolutely beautiful game with a gorgeous art style. If the art style looks at all familiar to you, that may be because this game is developed by Vanillaware, the same Vanillaware that developed Dragon's Crown and Odin Sphere, and the art is done by Amika Kita. The backgrounds are amazing. It looks like a watercolor painting that you'd see in an art museum, and the way the characters and other background objects are animated really do a great job at bringing this game to life. Now, you may remember that Dragon's Crown did get a bit of controversy for its, um, questionable character designs, but if that bothered you, you'll probably be relieved to know that that's not the case here. At least, for the most part. Objects in the background move, and characters in the background will talk to one another, and in some cases, Things they talk about will even be added to the thought cloud for you to use later. As for the presentation in the destruction sections, I'll admit it's not the most impressive, and with how cool the robots and enemies are designed, it's kind of disappointing that you're limited to this satellite-like view. But it still looks great for what it is, and it doesn't distract from the gameplay at all. Now, I can't comment on how well this game runs on the Switch compared to the PS4 version myself, but according to my other friends who played this game on PS4, this version actually runs better, surprisingly. Obviously, the footage you're seeing right now is in docked mode because I need it to record, but I did play a good amount of this game in portable mode, and even in this mode, I almost never encountered any lag, only slightly when there was a lot going on on screen. The sound design is also top-notch, and so is the voice acting. The music is an awesome mix of symphonic and electronic music. I mean, just listen. It fits perfectly for this game, and if that doesn't get you pumped for battle, I don't know what will. So, overall, what do I think of 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim? I think this game is great. It looks and sounds beautiful, the story and writing are fantastic, and the gameplay is really fun and addicting. It's also quite lengthy, taking me well over 30 hours to beat, so there's no doubt that you're going to be getting a lot of bang for your buck. And honestly, out of all the Atlas games that are getting Switch ports, I think this is one of the ones that needed it more than most. This game is perfect for playing on the go, and if what my friends have said about the performance compared to the PS4 version is true, I can also say that this is the superior version. I know this review was kind of short, and I don't expect this video to get a whole lot of views, and honestly, given what just has and what is going to be coming out soon for the Switch, I'm not expecting this game to sell too well either, but if you're watching this video, I cannot recommend this game enough to you. Even if you don't have a Switch, if you missed out on the PS4 version, give that one a try. You will not be disappointed. And that is going to be it for this video. I hope you all enjoyed, and be sure to tell me what you think in the comments. As always, be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you want to support me financially, consider leaving a Ko-Fi donation of just $3. Until the next video, I will see you guys later.